let me start at the beginning uh, with the, the basic, what do we mean when we talk about money? If you look at pictures of objects that have served as money, shells, these little flat iron things, coins, paper notes, it's obvious that you can't define money by its physical characteristics, almost nothing in common among these things. But what makes something into a money is the way it's used. Right? We need a functional definition of money. Uh, and, and I'll come to the sort of th theory of how money emerged, and that will sort of tell us what the most important characteristics in a functional definition of money are. But there have been, over through the years, uh, two basic approaches to understanding monetary institutions, and in particular to the origin of money. We see this debate being played out, but we see it at later stages too when it comes to understanding banking, when it comes to understanding central banking. There's what you might call the wise king theory of money. Uh, one of the contributors to this tradition, a German economist named Knapp, wrote a book entitled The State Theory of Money. Uh, and when it comes to the origin of money, it's the idea that somebody invented it. Presumably, some wise head of state who saw that it would be advantageous. Uh, and advantageous in comparison to a barter system. In economics textbooks, they don't usually say that directly, but they kind of hint at it by saying, here are the inconveniences of barter. Here's how much more convenient money is. That explains why we have money. But that doesn't tell us how we discovered how to use money or how to overcome the disadvantages of barter. The second alternative, and this is where I'm picking up on Peter's theme, is an invisible hand theory of money. This is an actual picture of an invisible hand, <laughs> which is slightly paradoxical, but you know, if I showed you a literal invisible hand, there wouldn't be anything there. Uh, this is the symbol of a group called the Association for Private Enterprise Education. It's their logo. Right? And it's the invisible hand ordering the world. But the, the th sort of gist of the invisible hand approach to money is it can be seen in the observation that money couldn't have been invented like a telephone, right? where a telephone is a technological breakthrough created in a laboratory. Money's not anything like that. We see monetary exchange in economies that have very primitive technologies. We see examples where shells served as money, and the shells serving as money are physically no different from the shells that are not money in other places. So it's not some physical transformation that turns, that, that brings about money. What brings about money is what you might call a social convention. It's a way of treating these shells that makes the money in some economy. Uh, and you can summarize this by saying money's a social convention, right? Rather than something that was invented. And like other social conventions, and Peter mentioned the example of language, it's something that emerges through time, through lots of efforts of lots of people, not coordinated from the top down, but from the bot uh, that emerged from the bottom up. An economist named Ross Starr has a book on this theme, and this is actually a quote from a preliminary essay. Uh, and he's saying it's hard to tell just an optimization story about why we have money, because although we can show that it's inconvenient to try to barter, I'll talk about that, how it's inconvenient in a second, and that explains why people find it more efficient to use monetary exchange. It doesn't explain how people monetize exchange because no one agent can choose to monetize exchange. You have to trade with other people in order to have a money in society. So monetization requires cooperation of lots of transactors. Uh, it's the outcome of a trading process. So we need to talk about the process that gives rise to this social convention. Uh, so I've got a different picture of Karl Menger than Peter had, but. In the same principles of economics, Menger had a section in which he offers really, I think, the first satisfactory explanation of how money emerges through a bottom-up process. Adam Smith had the idea that that's what had happened. He talks about money, uh, gold and silver serving as money through the common consent of mankind was the way he put it. 
But he didn't really explain how we got from barter to monetary exchange, and that Menger did. And I break it down into two steps. One, we have to explain why a typical individual is frustrated under barter and wants to do something different. Uh, something different is indirect exchange. So barter is direct exchange, the simplest form. You come to market with asparagus and you want to go home with a plaid shirt, then you need to find somebody who's both selling plaid shirts and wants to consume asparagus. That may be very difficult. You may have to search a long time. You may never find a person like that. So in a situation like that, you're better off if you can trade your asparagus for anything that is more likely to get you a plaid shirt. Okay? That's indirect exchange. You, trade, you make, then have to make two trades. But it can be to your advantage to make two trades. It can be easier to accomplish what you want to from trade, to go home with the thing you want to consume. So lots of people can stumble on that, but they may use different goods to accomplish it. The, the good you use to trade away later is called a medium of exchange. Different people may use different goods as a medium of exchange. So one person may be looking for salt, figuring I can trade salt for just about anything. Another person may be using peppercorns. Another may be using shells. Another may be using gold or silver. How do they converge on a common ex medium of exchange? And that, it turns out, is the textbook definition of money the functional definition of money, anything that serves as a commonly accepted medium of exchange, where medium of exchange is understood. I once wrote an article just <laughs> unpacking this phrase. Uh, medium of exchange is understood as something that you trade for, not in order to consume, not in order to put into an investment process, you don't know, plant it in the ground or put it in a machine, but only in order to trade it away later for what you really want to consume. So it's a medium for the exchange process, carries it forward. So why do people converge on a common medium of exchange? So the problem with direct exchange is often known as the problem of the reciprocal uh, reciprocity of wants problem. You have to find somebody who has what you want, in the case I gave earlier, has plaid shirts, and wants what you have. Uh, asparagus, in my example. But a common example that persists even today, because this is a, a market we haven't monetized, is courtship. <laughs> it's easy to find somebody who has what you want. They may not want what you have. Somebody else may want what you have. They don't have what you want. So there's a complicated matching process that goes on with a lot of trial and error. Uh, I'm not suggesting that we, could, that we ought to monetize the process. <laughs> but as long as we don't, then we have this very cumbersome search process that goes on. Well, now we have online dating. <laughs> so there are technological improvements. Uh, but here's indirect exchange. You come to market with asparagus. You figure, if I can trade it for salt, I've discovered that lots of people will accept payment in salt. Uh, and then I can go home with my plaid shirt. All right, so salt is serving as a medium of exchange. And maybe you come to market with asparagus. You're an asparagus farmer. And you don't know exactly what combination of things you want to buy because you're not sure what's for sale in the market. But if you have something that's commonly accepted, lots of people want to consume it, then you've got a better chance of buying whatever it is you want to buy. So if you come to market with something idiosyncratic, you want to uh, get something that's more popular. Right? And that kind of process is going to give rise to convergence, because once you start using indirect exchange, you start keeping an eye out for what other people are consuming and what they will accept in payment. If I see a lot of people will trade for salt, then I'm willing to be paid in salt for my asparagus, because I know I can buy from this big group of people. Well, once I start accepting salt, the group is now one person bigger. And then other people who want to trade with me will accept salt, and it grows on itself like a snowball rolling down a mountain, which is a better metaphor in a country with more snow than Israel, but you get the idea. So here's the implication of Menger's theory. You don't need a top-down story of how money emerged. You don't need some genius or some wise king. Uh, you don't need a collective decision being made. You don't need the Chamber of Commerce getting together and voting, what are we going to use as money, because we're frustrated with barter. In this kind of story, 
the first money has to be something useful, something people do want to consume. It has to be a commodity. So this is a story that gives rise to commodity money, and we're going to have to extend the story or sort of add some new complications to talk about how we moved, how the world moved from a commodity money system, right, which we had up until the last century, uh, into a system we have today where money is completely divorced from any commodity. Uh, so that story sort of goes hand in hand with the textbook definition of money as a commonly accepted medium of exchange. But textbooks will also tell you that there are two other roles associated with money. Some have a longer list, but these are the two most common ones. One is serving as a store of value, and the other is serving as a unit of account. Uh, I always tell students when they see store of value in the textbook, just cross it out. <laughs> it doesn't have anything to do with moneyness. Uh, well, that, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but a store of value is just an asset. And there, money is an asset, yes, but there are lots of assets. Any way you carry wealth from one period to another is an asset. Real estate's an asset. Stocks and bonds are assets. Houses are assets. Dishwashers are assets if they will last until next period. So this doesn't identify anything unique about money. The reason people talk about money as a store of value is they want to evaluate different monies as better or worse stores of value. That is, does it hold its value from period to period? So a money that's highly inflationary is a terrible store of value. You prefer a money that's a better store of value, preserves its value better from period to period. But unit of account means the unit in which accounts are kept, prices are posted, people bargain. That is something unique to money. It is a unit associated with money. Uh, I want to argue that this isn't sort of separated in the emergence of money from the medium of exchange. But people will naturally post prices in terms of the stuff they really want to be paid in. And so the emergence of a medium of exchange brings with it a unit of account, which is some unit of the medium of exchange. So in an economy where you, have, you own a store and you want to be paid in silver, because that's the commonly accepted medium of exchange, you could post prices in bushels of wheat. And then when people pay you, they have to know how many ounces of silver is equivalent to a bushel of wheat. Right? So the prices are posted in wheat. Somebody comes up to your counter with a bushel of wheat. You say, no, no, I don't want to be paid in wheat. That's just how I'm posting my prices. Well, why would you do that? You're just making life more difficult for everybody by forcing your customers to have more information. They have to know the up-to-date silver to wheat exchange rate. Why would they want to do that? You do sometimes see this. You do sometimes see the unit of account separated from what people actually want to be paid in, but it's only in pathological situations. So if you have a highly inflationary economy, you may post prices in the local <coughs> currency, pesos, or in the 1970s, <laughs> the old shekels, and yet, uh, you want to be paid in dollars. Uh, but in those kind of situations, everybody is already keeping track of the exchange rate from day to day. Uh, in a, within a, a money that people can rely on as a carrying its value from day to day, prices posted in it give you information that doesn't become outmoded quickly, people will price, pri post prices in terms of the stuff they want to be paid. So it's not too mysterious why we get a unit of account emerging together with the medium of exchange. So it's a separate function. You can think about it analytically as a separate function, but the two come together. Now there's one caveat I want to make about my story about the asparagus farmer, and that is if you lived in a world where it was hard to trade away your asparagus, to get what you actually wanted to consume, such that it took half the year, or it really cut into your time farming, or sometimes, you, often you failed to do it, so all you got was rotten asparagus, uh, having come home from the market without trading successfully, it would be very foolish of you to specialize in producing asparagus. And before monetary exchange emerges, people can't afford to specialize that much. You see 
economies where people produce most of what they consume themselves. I mean, the definition of specialization is you produce more of something than you consume yourself. So as monetary exchange spread, people could afford to or found it advantageous to specialize more because now they could trade more easily for what they want to consume. So in a monetary economy, you don't have to go around searching for what people will accept. You bring your asparagus to market and you sell it for money, whatever is the commonly accepted medium of exchange, and then you go shopping. Right? We're all accustomed to that. Nowadays, you don't go to the supermarket and when they say, how would you like to pay? You say, well, I can teach guitar lessons. No, you know that they expect to be paid in money and that's what you bring to the market. Now this invisible hand theory, although I like it, and I like it especially because it doesn't require some super mind who grew up in a barter economy to somehow come up with the idea of monetary exchange and get everybody to adopt it. It's a gradual emergent process, operates with an economy of information. People don't even have to understand why it works. They just have to see that indirect exchange works and observe what their neighbors are doing so it can just spread through imitation. Uh, not everybody loves it. There's a group who still endorse the state theory of money, call themselves cartelists or sometimes with a CH, chartalists. And one of the more respectable economists to enunciate this idea is Charles Goodhart. And here's the way he draws the contrast. Mangarians emphasize the private sector seeking to minimize the cost of making exchanges in the process of trading, and that's a fair summary of Menger's theory. Whereas we, cartelists, argue that the use of currency was based essentially on the power of the issuing authority. Currency becomes money primarily because the coins or monetary instruments, more widely, are struck with the insignia of sovereignty. Well, this seemed to me to be sort of putting the cart before the horse. Coinage is a fairly late stage in the development of money. What about shell money? Right? What about other kinds of commodity money that didn't involve coinage? But but wouldn't, it, wouldn't it make sense that there would be a middle stage of uh, credit? So instead of, if once like, I bring asparagus, I want shirt. Instead of trading it for salt, I'll go to a reliable person and I'll write down that yeah. the shirt person owes me a shirt. So credit. Uh, appears fairly early in economic history, and there are those who have what's called a credit theory of money. And it, it sort of boils down to people needed money because they needed to repay their debts. <laughs> but it seems to me that when you make a debt contract, you specify what it's going to be liquidated in. So in a barter economy, you can have barter credits. And there are lots of examples of that. Uh, there's a, a caste in India that traditionally went around with their cattle and if uh, people would borrow, they, they were sorry, they were borrowers and lenders, but they would lend grain in exchange for 1.1 units of grain next year. So that's barter credit, but they specified you can have credit without money. Uh, when you monetize other trades, then you monetize credit contracts. People will want to be repaid in money because that will get them whatever it is they want to consume. Uh, so I don't see credit as a vehicle which produces monetization, but it's something that gets monetized. I, I thought you might encourage like a government. Yeah, you get credit after you're registered and then that could um, incentivize the government to figure out how to run it better. Well, Let's say the legal system. You need, you need contract enforcement when you have credit contracts. Sure, so uh, legal institutions play a role in kind of defining what the terms of a credit contract mean. So when it says, I, uh, you owe me $100, let's say, we have to specify what it is that is a dollar for legal purposes of discharging the contract. But Typically, that comes after dollars, whatever they are, have already been adopted as a medium of exchange. Uh, so anyway, uh, like I said, I, if you start with asking what makes currency money, you've already jumped ahead. Currency is already a kind of money. It's a hand-to-hand -hand 
medium of exchange. Um, now, I think Goodhart is on to something, which is that silver and gold actually had a problem, which is in their natural state, coming out of the mine, they're not very uniform. And it was a big breakthrough, a technological breakthrough, which made gold and silver able to drive out all the other commodity monies when there became a way of making sure that the piece you were getting was of a certain weight and a certain purity. And that's what coinage does. So coinage was important to enabling gold and silver to sort of sweep out the other commodity monies. And coinage does involve an insignia of a, what you might call an issuing authority, but it's jumping the gun to think that issuing authority has to be the state. There was, in fact, private coinage before states monopolized it. So I want to get to that part of the story. Uh, but why precious metals? Well, I guess I've already given away part of the story. But in ancient Greece, oxen were used as money. And in some places, barley was used as money, other kinds of foodstuffs. And you can think of there being a kind of survival of the fittest. When people from an area that used oxen came into contact with an area where people were using silver, they had a choice to make about which money they were going to use. And we know that historically silver and then later gold uh, became the predominant commodity monies around the world. And why is that? Classical economists had a list of things you would like to have in a hand-to-hand -hand medium of exchange. You don't want it to spoil on you. That's a problem with barley if you keep it too long. Uh, you want it to have a high ratio of value to bulk so it's easy to carry around. Now, you might say that disqualifies oxen, but they actually walk themselves from market to market. So they did okay in ancient Greece where it was all agricultural and pastoral. Uh, you'd like to, something that you can make change with because right, the, the size of the purchase you're making may not be exactly equal to what you got paid in your last transaction. That's a problem with oxen. You, you can divide them, but once you do, spoilage becomes a problem <laughs> and they're no longer so portable. Uh, You'd like it to be uniform so you don't have a big hassle. You don't have to be some kind of an expert to know whether you're getting high quality stuff or low quality stuff. Uh, and you'd like it to have a fairly stable value over the course of the year. And that's a problem for barley because the week before the barley harvest comes in, you don't want to be paid in barley because you know the price is about to go down. And if you don't want to be paid a week before the harvest comes in, you don't want to be paid two weeks before because nobody will take it a week after that and so on. So it kind of unravels. So if you look at this kind of checklist, silver does the best. Uh, so it's a kind of survival of the fittest. But silver does the best once it's coined because until coinage, this is a silver nugget, it's not very uniform. Different purities and not clear how much pure silver is in this hunk. So that's the function of coinage. Uh, some people have been concerned over the years that, okay, the Mangarian process gets you a commonly accepted medium of exchange, but how do you know it gets you the right thing? If it's just self-reinforcing popularity, maybe something gets an accidental head start and then everybody gloms onto it uh, and it becomes the most popular just because it's the most popular to start out. And there are some goods like that where people care about popularity for its own sake. Uh, but in the process of money emerging, there's a competition among different commodities. So in ancient Greece, as I said, oxen were used as money. But as Greece became more urbanized, this is the example Menger gives, it became less and less appropriate to use oxen because in an urban environment, you had lots of people who couldn't grade whether they were getting a good ox or a bad ox. And it was kind of a mess to bring the oxen into the city. And copper coinage sort of drove out oxen. And early copper coins, it's a little hard to see, had an ox head stamped on them to let you know this does the job that the ox used to do. But here's my sort of clearer hypothetical example. If somebody says, I'll pay you in a silver coin or in a this big pallet of wood, they have the same value, let's say. Which do you want to be paid in? Hmm. Well, it's going to be hard to carry the wood around. 
plus, I've got to think of the next person that I'm going to buy from. It's got to be hard for me to unload the wood on them because they're going to say it's hard to carry around and so on. So through this process, people internalize the preferences of their potential trading partners. They know what other people are more likely to want to be paid in, and that'll make them want a commodity that has the features that other people want. So it's not just self-reinforcing popularity. There are different commodities that are contending, then you'll want the ones that have the most durability, portability, and so on. So this is what makes coinage important. So here's a different kind of non-uniformity. Here's gold dust, just little flecks of gold that people find in a river. In Gold Rush, California, that's what they were first finding. They were panning in the rivers. And the story goes that uh, the gold miners would go to a bar to drink whiskey. The way you paid was by pouring a pile of gold dust on the bar in front of you. And for a shot of whiskey, the bartender would pinch off one pinch. But the pinch is not really a very uniform unit. And Bars were accused of hiring bartenders just based on the size of their thumbs. Fights would break out. It was a messy system. So there was a need, a demand, for something more uniform than that. And private mints <coughs> arose in California before the government even was aware of the problem or responded to it. I'll come back to those private mints in a minute. But uh, here's some very early mint, early coins. And you can see how crude they are. They're only stamped on one side, and on the back was just a notch for holding it while it was stamped. And when I say stamped, I mean a guy with a hammer with the pattern cut out in it would hit the coin, or hit the lump of metal to turn it into a coin. Uh, that has a problem, right? If you're a sharp person, you might carve away. Because a lion's head here is supposed to signify it's a certain size and purity of coin. Some sharp operator might shave away some of it, and you can see it's not perfectly round anymore. And some of these others are even more. So te further technological improvements in coinage made them more uniform and harder to uh, filch the silver or gold out of them. Right? You got ridges along the edge of the coin was a great device for keeping people from shaving the coin. So here are some coins from private mints. Uh, I, I searched and searched uh, and couldn't find any pictures of private medieval coins, although there were some. And, but here are some later ones. So this is 1812. This is a copper token for like one pence uh, issued in Birmingham, if you can read the bottom of it. That's a very low value coin, privately issued because the Royal Mint wasn't bothering to issue low-value coins. So copper companies just took it upon themselves to produce private pennies. And they just circulated based on having a penny's worth of copper in them. Uh, but here's one of the California gold coins. It's $10. So the, these private mints didn't make up their own units. They were produ producing coins in the units people wanted, the common already established monetary unit, which in the United States was, was a gold dollar. But this is Baldwin and Company, San Francisco. That's who produced it. Uh, sorry? It's real gold. There was a lot of gold coming out of the hills in California. And they would take it to the mint to get it coined. Because otherwise, they would have to ship it back east to get it coined. Right? That was not going to happen. And today, we have private firms that certify weight and fineness. Lots of Swiss operations. Yeah. Uh, with the gold that was done in the 1850s, so yeah. did they have a full understanding that on a year-to-year -year basis it would be worth more or less as you change and writing down as $10 at a, I don't know, the danger, but the actual value is probably worth a lot more 10 years later, you know, maybe it's less than so, what was that? So the purchasing power is something separate from how many dollars it's worth, because the dollar just referred to how many grams of pure gold were in it. Right, so the dollar in, in a gold standard is a name for a certain amount of gold. Just like sterling silver used to designate it's a certain alloy of silver. And a pound sterling was literally one pound of sterling silver. Right? But yeah, the purchasing power could vary. 
we can talk about that. Uh, but historically, less than the purchasing power of paper monies. Okay, so why have governments typically monopolized the coinage industry? The floor is open for suggestions. There, yeah. Money for them? Revenue. All right. When you ask why is something monopolized, often the answer is to get a monopoly profit. And that could apply to state mints, too. Now, I'm talking about their ancient monarchs, right, who a lot of them were in it for themselves. Unlike a democracy where the state mint would never do anything that wasn't in the interest of the public. Uh, but there is, of course, an alternative possibility when you ask why does the government do X. We, we talked about it in the last uh, session. Sorry? Market failure, thank you. The government can do it better than the market can. And that's been a common view of coinage. The government took it over because you couldn't trust those private mints. How do you know they're not going to cheat you? Well, we can examine the evidence on this. Did the government mints maintain the gold or silver content honestly over the years? No, it's all downhill. Debasing the coinage is a source of revenue. That is, re replacing some of the silver with tin or copper or something cheaper. They eventually caught on, yes. But typically it was done by not announcing it. <laughs> Just producing coins that looked the same, used the same coin dies. Uh, they tried to give them the same silvery color, but yeah, less precious metal. Exactly. But I'll, I'll show you a picture, in fact. But yeah, people caught on eventually. Uh, when people caught on, do you think they would rather pay with the coin that had 20% silver or the coin with 40% silver? 20% silver. So the bad money is going to drive out the good money if they're treated by the law as having equivalent value. You'd be a fool to pay your debts in a high silver content coin. And so the bad money drives out the good. That's called Gresham's Law. So the silver That's right. People are evaluating the coins based on their silver content. Why? Because the rest of the world was. If you try to take the coin out of the city state where it was issued, nobody was going to say, oh, well, government of Venice says this is so many ducats. No, they're going to say how much silver is in it. We read about the biting the right to check the Yeah, so this is sometimes misunderstood. So gold coins, people used to bite to test their purity. And so you could say, Gold coins were the original bitcoins. <laughs> and people sometimes think that's because pure gold is actually soft enough that you can leave tooth marks in it. But nobody would produce a coin that soft. It wouldn't be useful. It would wear away so quickly. They produced an alloy. The gold coins were not 100%, were not 24 karat gold, such that if you bit it, your teeth would break. So that was the test. <laughs> if your tooth broke, it was okay. Uh, they hadn't sort of made it with some soft, cheap metal like tin. Uh, so it's monopoly profits that explain uh, coinage, the, the monopolization of coinage. And here are some pictures of Roman coins over the years. Actually, these are different faces on them, so it's not doesn't actually illustrate the same coin being. But from 40% fineness to 30% fineness to 20% fineness to less than 5%. Uh, Spanish silver coins became so debased that it became known as the black money. It was all tarnish and no silver. Uh, there are two ways to make profits from owning the monopoly of the mint. The profit in general is known as seigneurage. That's the technical term for it. From the French seigneur, meaning the feudal lord. Being the feudal lord, it was understood, carried the prerogative of having the only mint in the domain. Uh, one, you could do it honestly and just charge a high fee for turning raw silver into coins. If you're the only mint in town, you can charge a high fee. Uh, a lot of mints couldn't really do that. They, weren't, they had to compete with mints in other neighborhoods. 
but debasement, reducing the silver content was another way to make a profit. Either you could fool people into thinking the new coins have just as much silver as the old coins, and then they would accept them at, at the same value, and the mint master could buy as much stuff with the new coins as the old coins. Or if you could force them to be accepted by making them legal tender, then people would agree to take them because they could discharge their jet debts just as well with new coins as old coins. The old heavy coins would disappear, as I said, but the mint would still make a profit as, until prices rose to reflect the reduced silver content. Partly because the coins were so debased in medieval Italy, banks started to step in to provide payment systems, uh, payment services, private commercial banks. Uh, and if you look at these pictures of medieval bankers, what are they doing? Well, this guy, this is a sort of modern coin or token commemorative celebrating Credito Italiano. You can see he's got a scale in his left hand. He's weighing the coins that were brought into him. That would be part of it. The other part would be assaying them for purity. And recording in his books the deposit that's been made. Right? How much silver is it brought in? He's giving somebody book credit for that. Uh, this is a painting in the Prado. It's a little harder to see. These triangles are the platforms on his balance scale that he's holding in his left hand. And he's putting a coin on the scale and weighing it against some, thick, some uh, standard weight. So that was a big business for bankers. In fact, the, the symbol they hung outside their shop in the Middle Ages was a balance scale. They would weigh coins and also have some idea of what the purity of them was. Uh, and give people book credit. Why do people want book credit? Well, once they learned how to pay each other with book credit, with claims on bankers, they avoided the problem of having to test the coins. Because the book credits were perfectly uniform, they were denominated in pure units of silver. Medieval historians have turned this whole thing mysterious, medieval monetary historians, by referring to these units on the books of bankers that are not embodied in any actual coin, by calling them ghost monies. But the ghost money was just a pure unit of silver, which is how the books were kept. So not in any particular coin, because who knows what a ducat was worth from one year to the next? It could be debased. Or e even any two ducats might not have the same content. So. That was one reason bankers stepped in. They provided greater uniformity. So go back to the checklist of things you'd like in a money. They provided greater uniformity. Because the coins were being debased, the coins weren't providing uniformity anymore. Um, I should say the private mints did not find it in their interest to debase their coins. We have examples from these private mints. And they've been tested. And they are more precisely minted than the US government coins that followed them because the mint masters had an interest in having their coins trusted. If the word got out that this guy's coins were sometimes underweight, there goes his business. You wouldn't take your raw gold or silver to somebody whose coins wouldn't be accepted without testing, because now you've just eliminated the benefit of having a coin. You go to the co mints whose coins are trusted. So it was in their interest. And same thing today with the companies that produce bullion and gold biscuits. Uh, it's not worth it to debase it, so they lose too much business. It's only if you have a monopoly and can force people to use your product that debasement is a profitable strategy. So uniformity, the second thing bankers provided was greater portability. You didn't have to lug coins around. And as trade grew in volume and value, this became more and more important. So in the great medieval trade fairs, right, where people would come from all over Europe to champagne, let's say, and set up tents and sell their stuff to people from all over Europe. The bankers also came so that people who wanted to buy stuff didn't have to come with sacks of silver, which was dangerous and cumbersome. They just came and knew that their banker would be there. So if they wanted to buy something, their banker would transfer money to somebody else in the form of book credit. So it's easy to uh, see how bankers got into this. Imagine. Alfonso and Bartolomeo are both storing their silver in this vault, 
let's just call it a vault because it isn't a bank yet. And Al wants to pay Bart. First, he has to go to the bank, take out the coins, put them in his wheelbarrow, carry them across town. Or a technical term for this that I learned teaching in New York, schlep. He has to schlep his coins across town. Uh, Bart has to schlep them back to the bank. There's a lot of schlepping going on here. It's cumbersome, time consuming, dangerous. So here's an idea. Why don't we just meet at the bank? Because look at what this is accomplishing. At the end of the day, the coins are back in the bank, and all that we've done is move credit from Antonio's account to Bartolomeo's account. Did I say Alfonso? I meant Antonio. Uh, so let's meet at the banker. And he's got a book that records our deposit credits, and he can move them. So this literally what people did. We know from court documents, they actually met in the office of the bank and said, we really want to make this transaction. Will you do this for us? Because at the end of the, we don't need the wheelbarrow now. And at the end of the day, we've got the same situation. One account balances down by 100, the other one's up by 100. So bankers, i oh, sorry, vault keepers went from just selling storage services to providing payment services. So in this transaction, Antonio is, in a sense, not paying BART with coins. He's paying him with claims on the bank. Yeah. If, if the vault keeper was just a warehouse, like Gringotts Bank in Harry Potter, <laughs> then yes, you would move it from one place to another. But once people started using banks for payment services, they typically didn't care about getting the exact same coins back that they had brought in. So there, there were that, I mean, people did use banks just for storage, in which case they would bring in a sealed bag of coins and say, don't tamper with the bag. But ordinarily, people who wanted payment services found a cheaper way to do it. They would bring the banker just loose coins, and the banker would promise to give them back equivalent coins, not the very same coins. And that opened up a new possibility for the banker, which was don't leave all the coins in the vault, lend some of them out. Oh, so I'll come back to that, because that changes the character of what's going on. So now you have a bank, because a bank is defined as an institution that takes deposits and makes loans. Before, you just had a money warehouse. Uh, sort of the, the fast forward through the history of banking, at least the payment service side of banking, it's a lot of new ways of signaling the banker we want to make the transfer, other than going to the office together and swearing out oaths. So transfer by check, the person making the payment writes out an authorization. Dear banker, please transfer 100 to this other guy's account. Give it to the other guy. Bart takes it to the bank. But maybe that's not convenient. Uh, maybe Antonio goes to the bank. That's a Giro system. Today we have electronic funds transfer. The person making the payment signals the bank, put it in somebody else's account, and Bart knows he's been paid when it shows up in his account balance. Right? So that's electronic funds transfer. Just different ways of signaling the banker, but the banker terminology, the front end of the transaction has changed, but the back end hasn't changed. The back end is what goes on in the back office. That's where they keep the accounts. Uh, Banks discovered another product a little later that became very popular, in fact, more popular than accounts. In the 1700s, 1800s, banks had more currency liabilities than they had deposit liabilities. They gathered more funds by issuing paper currency than by collecting deposits. So here's a very early banknote issued by Childs and Company in London. Uh, I, I don't know if you can read it, 1729, so this is pretty early on. Promise to pay to, and it's got somebody's name written in, or bearer, bearer meaning whoever brings this note in, whoever carries it around, can come in and get paid 40 pounds on demand, so whenever you come in, and the amount, 40 pounds, is actually written in. It's not sort of pre-stamped. So that tells you it's a very old bank note. And then signed for the bank. So in the old days, the bankers actually hand-signed every note they issued. If we could just reinstitute that custom, we could control inflation a lot better. Uh, here's a modern bank note. In Scotland, banks still have the right to issue notes, private commercial banks. 
still issue paper currency. There are two other places, Northern Ireland and Hong Kong, where private banks still issue most of the currency. This is the Northern Bank. It's actually not a paper note, it's a plastic note. So the private banks in Scotland and Northern Ireland have actually led the technological innovation in paper currency, and central banks have been copying their anti-counterfeiting devices. So it's, it's plastic so that it's harder to counterfeit. It also doesn't wear out so fast. This little star at the bottom didn't reproduce well. It's actually a window. You can see through it, and it's got a watermark in it. Uh, and down here at the bottom is an electronic currency card, a Mondex card, which is a prepaid card, but it had the unique feature that you could transfer value from your card to somebody else's card without the bank knowing about it. So it wasn't like a check that had to be cleared through the banking system. It was like electronic currency. And I wrote my dissertation on banknote issuing systems like Scotland's in the 19th century. I was really excited when this was introduced because I thought my research is actually going to be relevant to something. <laughs> but it turned out there really wasn't a business case, as they say. They couldn't figure out how to make a profit from these cards because people weren't going to load enough money on them to make the float worth it to cover the cost of the chip on the card. And they found out the, car the chips were easier to hack than they were hoping. Uh, in electronic money, this is known as the double spending problem. Somebody might run an execute copy command and double their money. <laughs> it's an easy form of counterfeiting. So these never really launched. Uh, I've got some pictures of banknotes because I find them charming. But I like this one not only because I like the picture of the hog, but it's very clear what the deal is. This is essentially a contract. And it's a simple contract. Nippon Ginkgo Bank promises to pay the bearer, anybody who brings the note in, on demand, as long as we're open, 10 yen in gold. So there was a gold yen. This is clear what you're, it is you're entitled to. Uh, and I like the in gold because if it just says in dollars and the government can redefine the dollar, then the, the meaning of the contract becomes clouded. But this says 10 yen in gold. Uh, during the American Civil War, California, where they had the gold rush that I already mentioned, so fast forward 10 years, the Civil War starts, California still doesn't have banks. They're still on a gold coin standard. There's no paper money. Legally, California was part of the Union government, the North. And the North introduced greenbacks, unbacked, irredeemable paper money. And so, and they were legal tender notes. And according to the legal tender law, and California being part of the union, you could go to the go to California, and if you had a hundred dollar debt, give somebody a hundred dollar greenback. Now, in the market, a greenback dollar was worth about, well, it changed from year to year, but eighty percent or maybe sixty percent of what a gold old gold dollar was worth. So you could legally go to California and pay your debts with these greenbacks, but you'd have been shot. <laughs> They weren't going to have them. They were insisting on actual gold money. So Congress passed a special act to allow the creation of gold-backed banknotes in California, so-called yellow backs. Uh, and here's one. So it says at the top, redeemable in gold coins. So there's no confusion about what it's redeemable in. Not redeemable in paper dollars, just gold coin. Uh, the first National Gold Bank of San Francisco will, here's the contract, will pay $100 in gold coin to the bearer on demand uh, at our office in San Francisco. So the language is a little different for some reason in the US. In the US it says, will pay the bearer. In Britain it tended to say promises to pay the bearer. But it's clear what these are. These are debt contracts. These are IOUs. These are not warehouse receipts. Uh, here's Provincial Bank of Ireland. The bank has limited liability for its debts but not for its note debts, unlimited for note issue. Every note holder is going to be paid, even if we have to go back to the shareholders and make them chip in more. They've got unlimited liability for their notes. They adopted that voluntarily to get people to trust the notes. So here are some warehouse receipts. Uh, 
Here's a grain warehouse receipt. Grain of the kind, amount, grade, and condition described herein has been received for storage and upon surrender of this receipt and payment of all charges, that's the part I want to underline, payment of all charges will be delivered to the order of, and then they've got a name filled in. And here's a, a few years ago in the US, somebody had the idea of reintroducing warehouse receipts for silver, sort of going back to early medieval technology for some reason thinking there was a demand for 100% backed silver notes. And you can see all the language here, but the language says uh, storage fees. So warehouse receipts have to specify storage fees because otherwise who's going to cover the cost of storing? Why don't banknotes say anything about storage fees? Why don't they have to? They don't store the money. What do they do with it? They, they lend it out. So they're earning interest, and that interest covers, well, first, they're not storing nearly as much, but the interest covers the cost of running the vault. So that's the deal people get when they accept banknotes. They accept that the bank is waiving the storage fees in exchange for which they accept that the bank is lending out some of the money that would otherwise be in the vault. If you're a depositor, the deal is clear, too. If you're getting interest on your account, it's clear that the bank is lending out much of what you deposited, because otherwise, how would they pay interest on your account balance? You were lending to the bank. The bank is lending to somebody else. It's an intermediary. And you've got a debt claim on them, not a warehouse receipt. They, yeah. 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 So th there is this myth in the literature that the first banks to start fractional reserve banking, that's what it's called when you only keep a fraction of the money on hand, did it surreptitiously, defrauded their customers in a sense. If the customers thought they were getting a warehouse receipt um, or a warehouse claim, and in fact it was being lent out behind their backs. And the Goldsmith bankers, who were the earliest bankers in London to issue banknotes, before the Bank of England was established, there were private banknotes in London. They are often accused of this. Uh, former colleague and co uh, often co-author of mine named George Selgin actually looked in to the legal cases surrounding the Goldsmith banks. It's a myth. It turns out the Goldsmith bankers immediately started because they discovered that they could make a profit lending out the funds, competing for the funds by paying interest. So that's what made the Goldsmith bankers very, made people bring money in, the fact that they were getting interest on it. It became very popular very quickly. So you could get interest on your money and have your money available to you whenever you needed it. Uh, so that's a nice combination. But there is a danger in fractional reserve banking, of course, right? The danger is the bank will not be able to pay everybody who wants to be paid. So we have to ask, when is it feasible? And the economist uh, Mises, who Peter mentioned, had a nice analogy. He said, if you issue a tokens for 1,000 loaves of bread, and through the wonders of Google image search, I, I could find a bread token, <laughs> good for one loaf of bread. If you issue 1,000 tokens, good for one loaf of bread, you better have pretty close to 1,000 loaves of bread, because these tokens aren't good for anything else. They're only good for claiming the bread. You can't eat the token. The miracle of banknotes is you can spend the banknote just as you can spend the coin. So it does everything for you that the coin does, at least among people who know this bank and who are willing to accept this note. So once people start spending banknotes, the bank knows that they're not all going to come in for redemption, because why would they get the coin? They can make their payments with the banknote. So that makes fractional reserve feasible. Now, how small a fraction can you keep? Bankers had to learn that through experience, trial and error. And there were banks that blew up because the proprietors didn't know what they were doing, didn't hold sufficient reserves. Adam Smith talks about one in The Wealth of Nations called the Air Bank, ironically. That's A-Y-R, but it blew up like air. When is it a fraud? Well, only if they're promising that they're a warehouse, but they aren't. But normally, that's not what they did. Uh, a concern people have about 
private currency issue is if we got 20 banks and each issues its own currency, won't there be a chaos of 20 values of currency, floating exchange rates between two different banks? Well, it's true, we call this non-par acceptance. Par means at full face value, 100 cents on the dollar. It's true that would be a hassle for the bank's customers. But because of that fact, people will avoid banks whose notes and checks are not accepted at face value and favor banks whose liabilities are accepted at face value. So it's in the interest of a bank, it can do more business if it can figure out a way to get its notes and its deposits, its checks, accepted widely at full face value. So how can they do that? Well, they discovered this sometimes almost accidentally. Uh, here's the Suffolk Bank in Boston. The Suffolk noticed that people who lived outside of Boston would bring their country banknotes into town and they had to trade them for city notes because nobody trusted the out-of-town notes. But there was a whole business of note changing. It's like Thomas Cook does today, changing currency from one region for the local currency. And the Suffolk said, well, we can do that and we can do it more cheaply because we don't have to keep an inventory. We can just print up notes on demand. If people want local notes, we'll issue more of our own notes. And in this way, we'll get a bigger share of the circulation by buying up the out-of-town notes and creating more of our own notes. Uh, and they eventually drove the fee for this service down to zero. They were competing with other banks doing this. So how did they make their profit? They made it on float, right? Bank notes don't pay interest to the holders, but Suffolk Bank was buying out-of-town notes redeeming them for silver and then lending the silver out. So they're earning interest. And the more notes they can get in circulation, the more interest they can earn. What they discovered, contrary to their intention, was that they didn't reduce the circulation of country notes. Because think of it, they're now paying more for country notes than the other note dealers used to pay. So they're actually attracting them. It's like the theory that you can eliminate mosquitoes on your property by hanging out a lamp. Do you have these that attract mosquitoes? <laughs> Wait a minute, what's that? <laughs> You're going to reduce the number of mosquitoes by attracting them to your property? No, that doesn't work. Uh, and that's what they discovered. Not only did they have more of their notes, in cir their own notes in circulation, the country bank notes were easier to circulate now because they were not falling to a discount when they came to Boston. So both of them gained from this arrangement. Well, what were people holding less of? They were holding less coin. People who came from the countryside who didn't want their notes to fall to a discount would bring coin sometimes. Now they didn't have to do that anymore. In Scotland, the story's a little different. Uh, the Bank of Scotland is the first bank, and they think they have a natural monopoly. Well, first they have a legal monopoly. The Scottish Parliament says we're not going to charter any more banks. But the charter runs out. And they go to the British Parliament, because now Scotland's Parliament has merged to England's. And the British Parliament says, no, we're not going to renew your charter. In fact, we're going to create a new bank to compete with you, because we don't think you're loyal enough to the king. We think you're in favor of Bonnie Prince Charlie and all that. Uh, so they create the Royal Bank of Scotland. Royal is a pointed name. And when the Royal Bank opens, everybody's using Bank of Scotland notes. So they say, OK, if you want to create an account here, we'll take Bank of Scotland notes at face value, because we want your business. The Bank of Scotland didn't do that. They said, we're going to ignore this new bank. We will refuse to accept its notes. Uh, so we got an asymmetrical situation here. The, bank of, the Royal Bank, the new bank, is collecting lots of Bank of Scotland notes. And they do something clever. They don't sort of bring them every day in dribs and drabs for redemption. They let them pile up. Maybe you can see where this is going. They let them pile up and let them pile up. And after a couple of months, they borrow uh, Antonio's wheelbarrow that he's not using anymore. And they wheel all these notes over to the Bank of Scotland and dump them on the counter and say, pay the bearer on demand. The Bank of Scotland hadn't seen this coming. It never happened before. This was a much bigger demand than they'd ever faced. They were wiped out, all the silver gone from the vault. Now, they weren't insolvent. They still had assets, but they didn't have any coin. They had to wait for loans to be paid back before they could resume payment. 
So they had to hang out a sign that said, no silver payment until further notice. They were embarrassed. Royal Bank said, we're the only silver paying bank in town. They got a lot more business. That was their intention. When the Bank of Scotland reopened, they said, okay, two can play at this game. And it became a note duel. They would each collect the other one's notes and attack when they weren't expecting it. But both banks learned to expect it. So how could they prepare for a big redemption demand? Hold more coins. So now both banks are suffering because they're holding more reserves that aren't earning them any interest at the expense of interest earning assets. So eventually somebody gives them a textbook in game theory and they say, oh, this is a repeated game. It pays to cooperate. And they do. They get together and say, why don't we just swap the notes of each other that we've collected and try, instead of trying to embarrass each other. And then we'll both have uh, a, an assurance that we don't need to hold so much silver and we can both make more money. And that's what they did. Uh, new banks in Scotland out in the countryside, they were called provincial banks in Scotland, saw that it was a good thing to have your notes accepted widely. They made explicit agreements with each other. So you open a new bank, the first thing you do is go around to the other banks and say, would you please accept our notes at face value? If you do, we'll accept your notes at face value. Not because we want to do you a favor, but because it's a quid pro quo. And so you got these explicit agreements among banks to accept their notes and deposits, their checks at par. And we see a kind of reiteration of this in the growth of ATM networks. There wasn't any law that forced banks to accept each other's ATM cards even before they started charging fees for it, they did it in order to widen the acceptance of their own uh, ATM cards. So they formed networks to give wider acceptance to be able to attract more depositors. You can get your money back at thousands of locations instead of just our own ATMs. And so these are nationwide, uh, sorry, they're global now. When banks are collecting claims on each other, they need to swap them. And so that's what they do at the clearinghouse. There's a picture of the New York clearinghouse in the 19th century. It's a lot of clerks at desks. Now it's all done electronically. Uh, but there was a lot of paper shuffling in those days. So clearing meant toting up how much each bank owed and settlement was actually paying. The banks that had a net balance owed to the other banks paying and the banks that had money coming in receiving it. And if you do the math right, all the money owed adds up to all the money <laughs> owed to. Uh, and that's the settlement system. So here's the naturally evolved banking system. And this is what the banking systems look like in the middle of the 19th century, say in Scotland and Canada and some other places where this is allowed, where there's sort of natural evolution. And when I say naturally, I don't mean, you know, uh, made with organic fruits and nuts. I mean the same way we use the term natural in the phrase natural monopoly, in the absence of government privileges. A natural monopoly as opposed to an exclusive grant of monopoly. A naturally evolved system as opposed to a system that's been important, importantly distorted by or influenced by government intervention. Uh, gold and silver or precious metal serves as the unit of account and what you might call the medium of redemption. It's the stuff banks have in their vaults because that's what the banknotes are claims to. That's what the deposits are claims to. Uh, people don't carry around gold and silver coin to make payments. They use bank issued money. It's more convenient. They write checks. They get paid in banknotes many competing banks of issue. I mean, that's what happens if you don't stop it. If you don't have entry barriers, you get competition. The banks practice system-wide par acceptance because it's in their interest. Uh, but they continue to innovate in developing new payment techniques. So it's not a static system. And I mentioned S Scotland was what I did my dissertation research on, but Canada is another example. Sweden part of the United States, you might say, had a competitive system, New England. They allowed free entry. Uh, they had the Suffolk system organizing the uh, note exchange. Other parts of the United States, it's a big mess. It's different <coughs> rules in each state because it wasn't a federal matter. It was 
regulated state by state. So if you had 28 states, you had 28 different banking systems. Uh, but there's lots of historical evidence that these systems worked and worked well. And the Scottish system was the most technologically advanced banking system in the world. The Scots sent bankers to set up the banks in Canada and Australia and New Zealand and lots of other places. Question. Yeah. Uh, can you explain why the United States has had so many banking crises while Canada hasn't when they were both, uh, as you said, naturally evolving systems? What is it about Canada well, so it more stable than the United States? It's only New England that I would say. And New England didn't have the banking crises that the rest of the country had. But the main restriction in the U.S. was state governments said to banks, you're not allowed to establish branches, so-called unit banking. And even in the banks that allowed, a, even in the states that allowed a bank to have more than one branch, which is important for diversifying both the sources of funds and the investments, it's hard to lend to more than one industry if you've only got one office in one town. There was a big problem in Texas when it was a unit banking state and everybody was lent to the oil industry. Price of oil went down, two thirds of the banks failed. Uh, so that was the problem in the U.S., whereas in Canada, they allowed the banks to branch nationwide. So a problem in the oil industry would affect the branches in some regions, but it wouldn't bring down the whole bank because the bank was well diversified. And we also had restrictions on note issue. That's a more complicated story. Uh, but for that reason, the U.S. had financial panics in the late 19th century. Canada didn't. During the Great Depression, the United States had literally thousands of bank failures because we had 20,000 banks. Canada had zero bank failures. It's quite remarkable. Okay, they only had 24 banks, but none of them failed. So percentage-wise, that's pretty good. So does this show that more government control over the banking sector is better? Quite the reverse. <laughs> Governments have weakened banks uh, in many ways, but in the U.S., they weakened them by restricting their diversification. In other countries, by restricting bank capital, often in order to protect a favored bank from competition. So things that limit competition, limit diversification, uh, weaken banking systems. Now, we've changed that in the U.S. We now weaken our banks by giving them privileges, which causes moral hazard, but that's a different story. Now, uh, I said there's a a commodity standard, a gold or silver standard, and there's a kind of inertia to that. You're not going to get a movement away from that coming from market forces. There's a kind of a network effect. If everybody else is accepting silver denominated payments, that's what you want to use. Why would you switch to something that nobody else is using? How, you couldn't transact with anybody. That would defeat the purpose. Uh, and if nobody goes first, then you don't get a switch. So there's a kind of inertia. now. That's a good thing if you want to keep the system coherent. Uh, but if somebody proposes a new monetary standard, if it's actually better than the old standard, then you have a problem switching to it. And this is sort of the one case in which collective action might be justified. But the hard thing is knowing that it's going to be better than the old system. right? Because if it's a new money, not used anywhere, you don't have any evidence that it's actually going to be better than the old money. Uh, so people who wanted to switch from the gold standard to paper money, like, say, Milton Friedman in 1971, said, we can regulate the paper money much better than gold regulates itself. Oops, turned out not to be true. Uh, however, if somebody says, uh, we have the peso and it's a terrible currency and we see the US dollar is more stable. I'm going to switch myself to using the dollar for my savings. You can get spontaneous switch in the money people want to use through that kind of process. And then the, the proper role of government is just to get out of the way. There's no reason to make that illegal. Uh, governments do make it illegal because they want the profit from being the only issuer of money. But from the point of view of the public, it's a terrible thing to be restricted in what kind of money they're allowed to hold. Uh, so you can get spontaneous dollarization. So I, I don't want to make the inertia 
too extreme. There's some, but there's not enough to stop all switches. So how did we get from commodity money to paper money standards, or fiat money is the technical term? Back when, uh, well, in the Roman Catholic Church, God spoke Latin. So when God spoke Latin, he said, fiat looks, let there be light. Uh, fiat means a decree, right? Let it be. So that's what we call money by decree. Money that's not, whose value is not based on being redeemable into anything else. And here, the state theory of money does apply. <laughs> it is the state's imprimatur on a piece of paper, that a piece of fiat money that makes it valuable. Potentially, I mean, it can become valueless in a hyperinflation, but if they restrict the supply, it becomes valuable. So typically what happened was, first the note issue was monopolized. So the Bank of England is an example of that. They were given legal privilege of being the only note issuer in the vicinity of London. Its liabilities become widely accepted if it's the only note issuer in town. And in the case of England, there were other banks, but the other banks held Bank of England notes as reserves. That's what people needed if they wanted paper currency. Uh, and Although nobody planned that this would make the Bank of England into a central bank in other senses, they grew out of its note issuing monopoly. And then if you've only got one issuer of notes and the government declares we're going to let them suspend payments, or if it's the government itself, we're going to suspend payments, then you're on a paper standard. Okay? You no longer have the option of, of getting gold back from the bank. Um, and so now you've got a fiat money. And just like the medieval mints would keep the same name of the monetary unit, even when they were debasing it, they kept the same name on the monetary unit. It was still the dollar, even though it was no longer redeemable for gold. It was still the pound sterling, even though it was no longer redeemable for silver or gold. But it's no longer deno denoting a unit of metal. Now it's just a unit. An IOU, instead of being an IOU like a banknote, it's an IOU nothing. Yeah. So, as long as people will accept it, it'll serve its function. That's right. Can I ask a question? Yeah. We're talking about moral hazard being brought in by government um, restriction, or. By. But wouldn't it be the other way around? When you're private and no one is uh, regulating you, then the moral hazard happens? Because you want to lend out as much money as you can? So moral hazard refers to the phenomenon that if you're insured, you take less care. Right. So if there's no insurance, there's no moral hazard. Now you... But if, if I'm opening a bank, I want to be as leveraged you, as I can. If you have a system in which contracts are not enforced, then you could say there's a moral hazard. So if I'm a banker, and I'm going to issue more money than I can actually redeem. <coughs> and I know the government will relieve me of the responsibility for redeeming it, rather than declaring me bankrupt and liquidating me. If they'll pass a law that says I don't have to redeem, which was something the Bank of England could count on, then yes, there's a moral hazard. They're not going to take as much care to keep sufficient But reserves. if you're opening a bank, yeah. what do you care? You're a limited liability. Even if you declare bankruptcy, then you'd rather be making a lot of money, even if it's for a short amount of time until the, they find out about your scheme or whatever, but you're still making money, then have like a slower process of slowly building your reputation, okay. being leveraged on a low level. So let me say first, historically we don't observe that. <laughs> we don't observe that as a common phenomenon. There are isolated examples. Uh, why don't we observe it? Because the contracts were enforced and people were skeptical by the legal system. People were skeptical of new banks. It took a while for banks to get trusted. First they had to get the other banks to trust them and the other banks were suspicious. Uh, but only if you could get the public to trust your currency would it continue to circulate. There needs to be contract enforcement, so it's not self-enforcing in that sense. But it mostly but in order to operate as a bank, then you you need to have the trust of the other banks and yeah. later on the trust of the people. Yeah. If you want to be a large bank, yeah. You gotta have a lot of people trust you, and so you've got to earn that trust. Uh, but here's the legal story. This is these are Federal Reserve notes, but you could get pictures from other countries. 
It used to say, this note is legal tender and redeemable in lawful money. That meant gold or silver. Then they just removed that. This note is legal tender. So you can pay your debts with it. People have to accept it as canceling the debt. But the Federal Reserve is no longer obligated to pay anything for it. It used to be a debt of the Federal Reserve. Now it's not. This one I like even more. It used to say, we'll pay the bearer on demand, $100. Now it just says, ribbon, 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 $100. So that's the fiat. We're just declaring it $100. Why doesn't the public reject these notes and just say, well, forget about it. If you're not going to redeem these notes, then I'm just going to use gold coin. Well, the government has ways of reinforcing the use of the new fiat money. You can pay your taxes in it. In fact, you have to pay your taxes in it, not in something else. We don't take gold anymore. You're allowed to discharge your debts in it, and then Gresham's Law operates in favor of it. You'd be a fool to pay your debts in gold coin now, because that's now at a premium against paper money. And so the bad money drives out the good. Uh, some governments can go even far, sometimes go farther and say, no other money's allowed to be used. That's not the case in most countries. That's not implied by legal tender. That's a forced tender. But in the US, the federal government did require the public to turn in their gold coins. It was not legal to use them anymore. And the banks had to turn in their gold reserves to the Federal Reserve. So that kind of squelched any survival of commodity money. But uh, a student of mine and I have a paper we're trying to get published about Somalia, which is an interesting case, where the government disappeared. In 1991, there's a civil war. The government that ran the central bank disappears. The central bank actually is looted <laughs> and then burned to the ground. So there's no central bank. There's nobody to enforce legal tender laws. There's nobody to collect tax payments. They're just a bunch of warring warlords. And yet, this is the amazing part, the paper money continues to circulate. The Somali shilling continues to circulate. And it's just based on the expectation that it will continue to circulate. <coughs> so just the inertia keeps it going. And it became a kind of small payment because uh, the value of it fell, but, and people used US dollars for large transactions, but today people continue to use the old Somali shillings. There's no banking system. It's just to calculate changes. It's actually changes hands in exchange. Well, not just to calculate, to make payments. Right, but as a, as a form of change. Yeah. So, <coughs> why did we switch to fiat money? Why did governments want to make this switch? Well, again, two possibilities. It turns out the revenue motive seems to have been operative uh, in some places. In the United States, in the Great Depression, it was to, in the view that if the Fed would issue more money, it would help the economy recover. Uh, but you sometimes find textbooks saying that it's because it's a cheaper monetary system. If you have paper in the vault instead of gold in the vault, you don't have to dig up so much gold. That saves society the resources. This textbook actually says transaction costs, which is not quite right. But I think Dave Barry put it right in Dave Barry's Money Secrets. All the governments in the world, having discovered that gold is like rare, decided it would be more convenient to back their money with something that's easier to come by, namely nothing. And that, that about sums it up. So it, throughout this story, there's been a kind of path dependency. And that continues in the introduction of fiat money. You can't introduce fiat money until people are accustomed to using paper banknotes. But once they're accustomed to using paper banknotes, if you have a way of doing it, you can suspend the redeemability, and the notes will continue to circulate. Uh, George Selgin has an article in which he says, this is kind of like launching a satellite. You need a booster rocket to get it into orbit. Once it's in orbit, the rocket can fall away. So once it's circulating, paper money can continue to circulate. And you see this in the introduction of new currencies in, say, newly independent countries. In Lithuania, they had to make the new currency redeemable for rubles initially, because otherwise, how would people value it? But after a few months, after it achieved circulation, they said, OK, we're going to phase out redeemability for rubles. The thing that defies this kind of path dependency story is Bitcoin. 
because Bitcoin was never redeemable for anything. It's an IUU nothing that just seems to have launched itself by its own bootstraps. Uh, so that's a puzzle. But we've got about 10 minutes for questions in case I've said anything controversial. Yeah. Can you talk more about Bitcoin? Like what yeah, so economists are the worst people to ask about Bitcoin because we were completely surprised by it because it doesn't fit this Mangarian story. And so after the fact, we've tried to figure out what got it off the ground. Did it get off the ground? Oh, sure. It's, it went from being worth zero, the entire stock of Bitcoins, to now being worth three and a half million dollars. How much is for one? One Bitcoin is about $230. Because there was a point where it was $1,200. That's so right. It so like it was booming and then it fell. And now it, it's it, went through, it, went through a, it went through a kind of bubble. But it, for the last six months, it's been pretty stable. And it's only been in existence since 2010. So it's still Do you a, see a, future a young currency. Yes, if governments will let it have a future. So the future, the technology that goes with Bitcoin is called the blockchain which is a way of validating transactions without having to trust some intermediary. So you don't need a clearinghouse. You don't need a bank to transact in Bitcoin. Uh, but here's the remarkable thing about Bitcoin. As I said, ordinary currencies got their value by being redeemable for something. Bitcoin has never done that. What they've done to assure people that somebody isn't going to, since, you know, why, why should it be $230 per Bitcoin when it's just a computer file? Why can't the creator of Bitcoins just create infinite numbers of them and rip off everybody who's willing to pay positive values for them? Well, the program limits the quantity of Bitcoin. And that's publicly observable. All the transactions are observable. So instead of having a money back guarantee, they have a quantity guarantee, kind of like a limited edition print. We're not going to issue any more than this many. That makes the price respond when demand changes. The quantity doesn't respond at all. Can it bring on problems of unity of coin? Like different countries aren't being able, like what we're seeing in the Eurozone right now. Well, so the Bitcoin has a floating exchange rate against every other currency. Uh, but it's supposed to replace everything eventually. It thing. has this handicap that the price is quite volatile, which makes it a lousy you wouldn't want to keep your rent payment in a Bitcoin account because you won't know if you're going to be able to pay your rent at the end of the month if Bitcoin is down. So you want some, unless your landlord is willing to accept a bit, write a Bitcoin denominated contract. So I, I used to say when I was talking about Bitcoin, yeah, people use it as a kind of hobby. There are a few things you can buy with it, but mostly people speculate in it. I've never met anybody who has ever paid in Bitcoin. And then I met somebody from the Bitcoin Foundation who said, I actually get my salary in Bitcoin. Is your salary contract written in Bitcoin? Oh, no, it's written in dollars. I just get paid in Bitcoin. And then I have to convert it if I want to go shopping. <laughs> so that was just for fun that they, did not, that they actually pay it in Bitcoin. But it has a very limited use. The main commercial application at this point is international remittances. And it's especially valuable if the official remittance system is very expensive or if government is trying to restrict capital flows. So the, the big run-up in the value of Bitcoin came when Cyprus was collapsing and people wanted to get their money out of Cyprus. The government wouldn't let the banks transfer people's euros outside of Cyprus, but they left a loophole open, which was people used their euros to buy Bitcoins and then they transferred the Bitcoins out and then repurchased euros and put them in an account somewhere else. There's also a lot of uh, money laundering going on. It, it's a kind of cash, so it's subject to money laundering and illegal transactions just like any kind of cash is. Now, you have they could have done that with just shares, for example, bought IBM shares and then repurchased them in the um, There, I guess they could have if there was a stock market in Cyprus in which you could buy IBM shares. I'm not sure there is but you could certainly buy Bitcoin. And, and the, the transfer technology was all in place. <coughs> uh, separate question. Part of the um, effect on these PMs is the marginal effect that money is out of circulation. 
physical money dollars end up just sitting in my drawer. Or Sorry, as a result of what? As a result of human error, not paying it to the bank or not using it. Money falls out of circulation. What do you think the change will be in the next five years, ten years when almost, I would imagine, all payment, all our money will be done through all the watch or whatever it is, but not going to walk around with any cash. Yeah. Um, whether that's 10 years or 30, it will happen. So what do you think will be change on the economy as a whole when all money is coming? I think it's just a gradual evolutionary change. People have been, I don't see any dramatic shift. Uh, if money was all in checking accounts and none of it were in currency, which I think the government of Norway is trying to bring about, actually, uh, I don't think it makes a big difference, except that it makes it harder to hide things from the government. Right? And if the government is trying to oppress people, then it's good to be able to hide things from the government. If they're trying to collect taxes, then I guess it depends on whether you like the taxes or not, <laughs> whether you think it's okay for people to hide from the tax man. Uh, there's a novel, a science fiction novel, uh, called Neuromancer, uh, which imagines a world in which the governments have outlawed currency so that they can trace everything and tax everything. And I'm sure the Norwegian government wouldn't do that because they're nice, but there is that danger in having everything trackable and traceable. Uh, if the government is uh, uh, oppressing some group, it's going to be harder for them to get their wealth out of the country uh, if everything's, if there's no cash. But people have been predicting the death of cash for a long time, and the, the percentage of the euro money supply that's in paper currency, the percentage of the U.S. dollar supply that's in paper currency really hasn't changed much. However, the denominations have changed to where in the U.S. dollar, half of it is in $100 bills, and in the euro, half of it is in 500 euro notes. <laughs> so I think that must be black market transactions, overseas transactions. There are a lot of $100 bills in Russia, uh, suitcases in Miami, <laughs> that sort of thing. But I expect to see a lot of that in the future. Uh, but there are governments that are saying, oh, well, in that case, let's just wind it down. They're actually proposed this for the, the note will lose value every day and they get to zero. So they would issue a $100 note that becomes $99, $98, $97. So that you don't keep money in cash. There was a proposal in the U.S. to change the color of the $100 bill every month. So you would have to turn them in every month. And then you would have to identify yourself <coughs> and provide proper papers. But it's clear that the purchasing power does not change a great deal of the shape of the Right. Yes. Uh, yeah, so in principle, if it could be properly managed, paper money could hold its value just as well as gold, or in principle even better, if the people managing it knew what they were doing. And actually behave themselves. It just hasn't been our historical experience that they... Yeah, so our historical experience is that paper money has not held its value nearly as well as gold and silver. And the people managing it haven't done well enough to avoid high inflation. They've gotten better. Inflation's lower now than it was in the 70s and 80s, but there's no guarantee that it won't return. We have time for one quick question. Okay. Okay. <laughs> you, you showed um, a few countries where the banking system evolved uh, naturally. There's, there's about 60 of them I could have showed. Okay. So I was wondering what happened or what caused uh, this system to be as complicated and regulated as it is today? Yeah, it's a good question. There, there's a book by Vera Smith entitled The Rationale of Central Banking, where she discusses the debate that took place in every country about establishing a central bank, a government central bank, to control the banking and monetary system. And it was a debate. It wasn't that everybody agreed that free banking didn't work well. Uh, so in Scotland, it's a different story than in every country about why the Central Bank Act passed. but. 
in Great Britain, it was basically they decided to homogenize the Scottish system with the English system, which meant bring them under the control of the Bank of England. In Canada, as I mentioned, they had a solid banking system. Uh, the government appointed a commission to, to uh, decide whether they should go get a central bank. This is 1934. They still don't have a central bank. The two bankers on the commission say, no, we don't need a central bank. We're doing fine. But there were three political appointees who were appointed because they were going to decide that they needed a central bank. So it was political reasons. It was nationalism. It was to satisfy the inflationist interest. Uh, and this sounds silly, but two economists who wrote a study of why, what the arguments were that persuaded the members of the Canadian Parliament said one of the biggest arguments that persuaded them was there were all kinds of international conferences of central bankers and Canada couldn't send anybody. <laughs> and they felt left out. So if you want to be a full-fledged nation, you've got to have a central bank, they say. Although a lot of countries today still don't have central banks. That's an interesting debate in those countries. All right, thank you.